welcome and thank you for joining this Fertility Within Reach live webinar, Optimizing Your Chances of a Successful Pregnancy and Healthy Baby. I'm Jennifer Neely. I'm part of the Fertility Within Reach board and we're thrilled to welcome these distinguished guests to discuss this important topic. I will be asking questions generated by those of you here in the community. Add them with the tag Fertility Within Reach in social media. We want to let you know that this webinar is brought to you, of course, by Fertility Within Reach, and it's part of a webinar series that aims to educate about how conventional and alternative medical options could work for you so that you can make informed choices and advocate for yourself and loved ones. Let's turn to our panel. I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves, and I want to start with Dr. Nidhi Sachdev from OC Fertility. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Dr. Demary. It's nice to see you. Uh, my name is Dr. Nibby Suchsave. I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist. I practice here in Newport Beach. I'm at OC Fertility, and we're part of the CCRM Orange County Network. Wonderful. Let's move over to Dr. Demary. Hi, Welcome. everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Can you guys see me and hear me? Sure I can. Okay, perfect. So my name is Afruz. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I've been practicing for 13 years and I have a huge passion for fertility because I struggled with one ovary, Hashimoto's, miscarriages, fibroids, and I've been through it all. So this became a passion of mine, uh, not because I wanted to, but because I wanted to have like 10 kids and I was terrified to have another child. And so I went into integrative endocrinology as my fellowship, and um, yeah, I have training in both conventional medicine as a primary care physician, but also in Chinese medicine, herbs, nutrition, diet, and lifestyle. Thank you for those, those overview and, and the personal part of that. I think a lot of people can resonate with your experience here. I want to start by jumping into our topics here, um, and our first one is what should and any one of us be doing as we're trying to get pregnant. Perhaps we can start with the traditional point of view. We can start with Dr. Sachdev and you can hand over to Dr. Zemeri. So I think this is key. For me, I think a big part um, of taking care of patients is education. For me, it's important that the patients understand what's going on and why we're doing things. So when somebody says, well, what should I be doing prior to trying to get pregnant? For me, it's understanding how the menstrual cycle works, understanding your body. So taking some time, whether it's by reaching out to an OBGYN or a fertility specialist just to understand, well, what is the menstrual cycle? How do I know that I'm having regular menstrual cycles? Am I, you know, so I would recommend keeping track of your menstrual cycles. You can download, there's several apps in which patients use to keep track of their cycles and understand, okay, am I having regular cycles? You know, and, and paying attention to your body. Are you having a normal amount of bleeding or what you would think would be a normal amount of bleeding? Or does it need to be heavy or excess? And I think reaching out to your local providers to talk about things that don't seem to be appropriate. Sometimes people can have issues with having sex or intercourse. There's pain with intercourse or there's difficulty either on the male side or the female side. So I think a big thing is just understanding your body and understanding the process of trying to get pregnant. And I think that's key because if you are having issues or there could be potential issues, you want to identify it well before you're trying to get pregnant. That way there's less stress and anxiety when you actually are trying to get pregnant. I love that. I agree. I would add, um, I think the goal of both of us is to get our patients pregnant and to make sure that they don't miscarry and that there's no issues with birth and that they have a healthy baby that isn't going to end up, you know, with eczema and asthma and autoimmune disease and heart disease and diabetes and things down the road. So my goal and all our goal is really to make sure that not only are you hormonally balanced, that you look at your body and look at your symptoms wherever you are in the stage and go, what kind of symptoms do I have? So me as a naturopathic doctor, I'm trained to look at you holistically. Look at if you're coming in with fatigue, with headaches, gas, bloating, diarrhea, migraines, uh, my job is to figure out what is sort of the root cause of all of those symptoms. So start with that. Don't only look at, am I ovulating? Uh, am I, am I, is my menstrual cycle okay? That is the first place because in order to get pregnant, you absolutely have to ovulate and that sperm and egg have to meet. So that's, that's step one. So check everything that Dr. Sajnev just said, but also look at your thyroid function. Get a complete thyroid panel, TSH, 
free T3, free T4, look for antibodies, make sure there's no Hashimoto's, which is so common in my practice, and make sure there's no autoimmune issues. I, I can't tell you how many patients I see who've had recurrent miscarriages, their third, their fourth. A couple of months ago, I had their 10th, and there's usually an autoimmune issue. So sometimes we need to do more advanced testing, and that's probably, Dr. Sachin, when they end up seeing you, when they've been struggling, but our goal is to prevent that and see if we can get you, if you're coming off the birth control pill, give yourself time. And I know we may not agree on this, but I, I don't like when my patients just get off and right away they get pregnant. Even three months for me is not enough because there's nutrient deficiencies that can be caused by the pill. It changes your microbiome and the immune system of that baby. Hopefully if you have a vaginal birth, is all about your microbiome and the bugs that you have in your gut. So take some time. If you're on medications, if your husband's on medications, if you have health issues or you have a strong family history of, let's say, heart disease, maybe look at homocysteine and get your MTHFR genetic mutation checked. And now a lot of these things I mentioned, they're not set in stone yet. They're not in the guidelines yet. As you know, a lot of the research when we do, it takes about 17 years for it to finally, you know, for us to have enough research and then it gets taught to us in medical school. So some of these things, we have to keep up to date on the latest research and it's always changing. It's not setting stone. So you want to work with your doctor and say, Here, here's my health state. Here's my blood sugar. Here's my insulin. Here's my body fat. This is my lipid panel. Here's how inflamed I am or I'm not. Um, ovarian reserves, viruses, you know, maybe a pelvic ultrasound that I didn't do. And I had a massive fibroid and I had ovarian cysts and I had all these MTHFR gene mutation and I was loading up on folic acid and my daughter is not able to process that because she's completely got two of those mutations from mom and dad. So sometimes we do need advanced testing, but at least start with your symptoms. I always say your symptoms are a sign. Symptoms are never just randomly your body deciding all of a sudden it's going to lose its hair. That could be that you don't have enough iron and ferritin is very important for fertility. It might be that your thyroid is low functioning and you're hypothyroid and you're cold. Um, it might be that you're really stressed. So I'll stop there. But I, my biggest thing is always look and listen to your body. Your body gives you clues. It tells you what's going on and what's off and what needs attention and pretend you are pregnant. Pretend that right now you are pregnant and you are doing all the things uh, that you would normally do if you were pregnant. Don't wait to make changes until you get pregnant. I think that's key because so many people, just so many patients that I see have, haven't gone to see a primary care doctor or even a gynecologist. So many wow. people in their 20s and 30s aren't you know, as up to date on their health maintenance as they should because they figure they're young, they're healthy, right? Mm -hmm. And getting pregnant is something that people, a lot of people think it's just gonna happen. It happens naturally and many people get pregnant. Mm -hmm. But you know, listening to your body and understanding what's going on is key. And when you get pregnant, you wanna make sure that you are as healthy as you could be because mm -hmm. when you are healthy, it leads to a healthy pregnancy, right? And so there's many things that can happen in a pregnancy. So one, so health maintenance is important. So make sure you have a primary care doctor and get evaluated, right? Make sure if you have risk factors, you're screened for diabetes. If you have risk factors, you're, you know, you get a lipid panel to make sure that it's not elevated, um, you know, weight, right? Weight and exercise, looking for insulin resistance, that's important. If you have potentially, if you're pre-diabetic, you definitely want to help make sure that's under control before you get pregnant, right? When Absolutely. you're pregnant, you're at a much higher risk for diabetes, whether you're pre-diabetic or not. But if you're a pre-diabetic, that's important to know because you may be managed differently. You may want to be tested earlier. You don't want to be tested in your third trimester to find out if you're a diabetic, if you have a higher chance of it. So I think that's totally key. And just like you mentioned, people can have underlying issues that they're just not paying attention to. So mm -hmm. oftentimes when people do have autoimmune issues, inflammatory bowel issues or rheumatoid arthritis, just that underlying inflammation from things being under not being well controlled can affect your fertility. And we find that once patients are actually treated and approve those, they tend to get pregnant a lot quicker. So you're right. I think a lot of, a lot of emphasis is placed on, okay, just the, the gynecologic issues, which are important, but your overall health is important too. So yeah, I think we can go back and forth on whether you should order all those tests right off the bat. But I think the yeah. important thing is getting a sense of what's going on, right? Even yeah. if you feel perfectly healthy and you're not checking off any of those boxes, it doesn't hurt to, you know, have a primary care doctor, right? Have Absolutely. a gynecologist. Pap smears are so important to make sure you're up to date on a pap smear. 
because if you have an abnormal pap smear when you are pregnant, your options for diagnosing the issues are limited. Yeah. So I think okay. just like you're saying, optimizing things, right? I mean, that's the key. All right, optimizing your health is going to ultimately optimize your, your pregnancy. I love that because I have to tell you, one of the biggest things patients will say, the difference between a medical doctor who's conventionally trained and someone like myself, a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doctor, is that MDs are just there to make sure everything is within the normal range, whether it's right at the bottom or at the top that it doesn't really matter. If TSH is even at 4.5, 4, you're good with that. And I love that you're saying, no, actually, we want optimal. We want it to be, you know, especially for preventing a miscarriage, we don't want a TSH of 4, even though that's still not technically considered hypothyroid, or we don't want a ferritin right at the bottom. We don't want things just, just to be in the norm, especially if, like, you look at how these ranges, where they came from, what part of America, we want to optimize because, I, I have had patients that are heroin addicts. I've had patients that really are not in the best shape and they get pregnant and somehow don't know how it defeats science, right? They have healthy babies from what we can see, right? So it's not always about getting pregnant. It's have you done the best that you can do to get yourself in the best shape possible? So that egg is as best as it can be. And, and that sperm is as in the best quality that can be. And then you, you, you know you did it. I mean, this is the rest of that child. If you have a girl, you're also carrying her eggs in you. So you can actually be epigenetically affecting two generations. And so I always say, take three months, take at least three months to give yourself time because you never know, especially now we see this all the time, infertility is on the rise, male fertility is on the rise things can sometimes take longer than expected. So give yourself time to do the basic test. Don't over test. So a lot of these tests that I do, I'm not running every single thing on everyone, yeah. but they were, they're coming in saying I've had a miscarriage. Okay. So then I'm doing all the autoimmune tests. I'm checking progesterone seven, six days after ovulation. I'm doing, you know, these things if they're over 35. So it really depends, but I'm also seeing young guys with low testosterone. I'm seeing younger women have issues. I'm seeing 13, 14 year olds much more with PCOS than I ever did 20 years ago. So maybe we'll get into that and talk about toxins and things like that. I think the key is though, I think when, especially fertility in the the era of social media, I think that it's easy for people to compare themselves to others. You know, Mm -hmm. I've had patients who were smoking and having issues and say, well, other people smoke and they get pregnant. And that could be just like you said, very true. But I think the bottom line is that not everybody's created equal. And whereas some people, the subtlest things may affect their fertility, whereas other people can do many different things and they're still getting pregnant. So I think the key is understanding that is that, yeah, I mean, could somebody get pregnant and have a perfectly healthy baby by not optimizing things? Totally, right? That's probably the norm, but some people are going to fall into that subset mm-hmm. of people that need to have things in the optimal range in order to optimize their outcomes. And I think just understanding that ideally before you get to the point where you've been trying for a while is going to just increase your chances of having the success and, and having that happen in a way that isn't mentally, mentally and emotionally taxing. I love the way you said that. And that, that's my personal story. I was that girl that I was like, I'm young, I'm I didn't do drugs. I was good. And then when I did things went wrong is when I had to wake up and go away to things and they have their glass of wine and they drink tons of coffee and they do this and this and this, and they had healthy kids. Doesn't mean that that's how genetically or just who I am. So we can't keep comparing. You're absolutely right. And now with social media, that's what everybody does, you know? So they'll be like, but do I really, do I really have to do that? And I'm like, I don't know. I can't tell you a hundred percent. But that this is what a your labs are saying, but also your body and your symptoms, and then what's what's happened. So I think it's really important point that you just made. That kind of brings us to how one assesses their current state of fertility. It definitely builds on what you were both just discussing. We can talk about as a fertility doctor. This is what I do all day long. So we talk about fertility, and I think the the main issue is that men and women our fertility differs, right? Yes, there's age um, related infertility with men and for women, but it's very different for men, right? Men are undergoing spermatogenesis throughout their adult life. In a 70 year old, yes, his fertility is less than a 30 year old, but a 70 year old can still father a child. Whereas women, we're born with all the eggs that we have. And over time, that pool of eggs depletes, whether you're trying to get pregnant, whether you're on birth control, or whether you're not even 
ovulating, our pool of eggs depletes. So the, in the traditional sense, the way that I assess someone's ovarian reserve is kind of threefold. One is ultrasound. I do an ultrasound to look at someone's ovaries, to look at how many eggs or resting follicles they have, ideally at the beginning part of their cycle. And I'm counting something called an antral follicle. Um, we call it the antral follicle count. And so the greater number of resting follicles you have, presumably the greater pool of eggs you have. Um, so that's one. And the other two are blood tests. One is called an AMH, an anti-malarian hormone. So an AMH is a hormone that our, um, our resting follicles will secrete. So the greater your AMH is, presumably the greater the pool of eggs you have that are resting. And then the third is also blood. It's called an estrogen and FSH. And this is key that they're done together. And they're done at the beginning part of our menstrual cycle. So an FSH is a hormone that our brain actually produces and um, our ovary then uses that to grow an egg. But the pool of eggs that we have that are resting actually secretes another hormone called inhibin. And that hormone then sends a signal to not release the FSH. So when you have a smaller pool of eggs, that inhibit hormone is less, and then you'll have a rise in the FSH. So at the beginning part of our menstrual cycle, if we have an elevation in the FSH, it actually indicates that we have fewer eggs. So when looking at all these, the AMH is helpful, the antral follicle count is helpful. The estrogen and FSH is helpful, but it's really only helpful if it's abnormal. If it's in a normal range, it's not telling us much more than the fact that it's normal. So that's kind of the basis of how we start. And I always counsel patients that these are really helpful and useful information, but they're really only helpful when putting into context for what's going on, right? If you're someone who's never tried to get pregnant and I do all these tests in your ovarian reserve that's on the lower side, that doesn't mean that if you tried to get pregnant today, you won't. What it tells us is that yes, your ovarian reserve might be on the lower side. And so maybe we should use that information to start planning if you're thinking about delaying trying to get pregnant, maybe you want to incorporate that. Or if you're considering preserving your fertility, we can use that to make a plan. But the key is that we can't hang our hat on just numbers. It's, it's our whole body. It's our whole history. And that's what's important. Do you use AMH on everyone? Are you using it more for if you're doing IVF or... You know, are you assessing if they have PCOS and let's say their AMH is really high and looks good? I tend to get on almost all of my patients so I can come up with a treatment plan and I can counsel them. But I, I, I make I like it clear that. that like, you know, we're not, it, 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 the data has shown that the AMH is a best prognostic factor if you were to give someone medication like for IVS, how mm -hmm. they would respond, yeah. right? So I use it as a way to counsel them. And yes, like when somebody has a high AMH, it's secondary to having a big pool of eggs or follicles. And we do see that in PCOS. Mm -hmm. But I usually counsel patients that at a certain cutoff, high is high, whether yeah. it's super high or it's just, you know, moderately high, it doesn't make a difference to me. High is high. And then we kind of use that to. Yeah, I love that. that. Yeah. I, I, I do the exact same thing. So I, get, I like that we're on the same page there. Um, yeah. I also counsel and make sure they're having that cervical mucus egg white discharge, um, mid-cycle, figuring out when they're ovulating and making sure they have enough of that luteal phase for that inflammation implantation to happen. If they're too irregular, if they're not even sure when they're ovulating, then I will, will help them figure that out, right? And make sure they have, as older they get, the eggs get older, the progesterone is going to go down because the quality of that egg isn't as good and that can contribute to miscarriage. So I don't know where you are on this, but typically if that is the case with my patients, I like to actually get them on progesterone before they get pregnant. From what I have seen, it's not always helpful once they're pregnant to start progesterone. What, what, do, you, what do you do? Typically when I prescribe patients progesterone, I don't like to give it to them unless I know that they ovulated. Because I find if I give yes, it too early, it absolutely. causes an asynchronization of it. So yeah. I usually will give it to patients when they're trying to conceive because yeah. the half-life of the progesterone that we're giving isn't super long. So it, if we're giving it prior to ideally implantation, yeah. I, in my opinion, I think that's sufficient, but I just have to make sure that they are doing it at an appropriate time. Sometimes absolutely. I'll see patients kind of using it incorrectly and mm -hmm. if you're taking the progesterone too early, then it can put the uterus kind of out of sync with the... Right, with the, exactly. Right. And sometimes patients I've had, they, they even forgot or they're taking yeah. it all month. And I'm like, well, maybe you're not even ovulating now because your brain thinks yeah. you've got enough progesterone. So that's oh, yeah. really important. So make sure it's taken after ovulation. So yeah, the cycle that, that we call it the fifth vital sign is so important to know if, you're, if your periods are getting lighter and lighter and lighter, you know, I... Mine are like one or two days now. And so I know my estrogen is probably, that's very important to have enough. But if you used to be five days and now you're skipping periods and, and the lining is very thin, 
that's going to be an, something you definitely want to talk to us about. Um, if the flow is super heavy, you know, that might be from progesterone deficiency, and that's also not good if you're bleeding two weeks of the month. All these things are important. And even for me, from a Chinese medicine perspective, period cramps, having dysmenorrhea, having clots, having pieces of lots of dark stringy material that's coming out on day one for me is abnormal. So I look at everything from the color on the first day to you know how you're feeling before your cycle if you have estrogen dominance or having too much estrogen during that second half of your cycle you might get tender breasts be very moody you know and, and just be like a different person as husbands sometimes will say and have pms or pmdd so these are all hormonal imbalances but on top of the hormones we we already went through this thyroid for me is huge TSH, free T3, free T4, and even a TPO antibody test to see if the thyroid's working well, and all the other markers that Dr. Sajnav mentioned, inflammation, lipid, glucose. Um, I probably go into more optimal ranges, so I want my vitamin D on my preparing for pregnancy patients to be not just in the 20s or 30s and just barely making it. I prefer, especially now with COVID too, the higher the D, around 60, 70 would be ideal. Uh, making sure their melatonin, which is an antioxidant, also important for ovaries and their sleeping. So we'll talk about that when we get to lifestyle. But there's lots of things we could test, but we only test them like prolactin if we feel like something's wrong. But at least get the basic panel done um, and assess your fertility state now. So you can see, okay, where am I now? What things are good? What things are not optimal? How am I going to make it optimal in the next three or six months? Sometimes if you find out, I've had patients who've been on the pill forever and they get off and now they don't get a period. And I've had, I was taught there's no such thing as post-pill amenorrhea when I was in school. I don't know about you, but I've, somehow all these people find me and I'm like, wow, this is in, insane. How, what am I going to do? So if I can't tell you how many people didn't get that informed consent so just give yourself time in case it takes a little longer now not everyone that's not the case for the norm but if you happen to be that person that's coming off the pill and you don't get your period and you don't ovulate and you're like ready to go you know you just want to be careful yeah i agree because when you're when you're on the birth control pill it masks your ovulatory cycle right the whole point is that it keeps you from ovulating yeah. um, the same thing with an iud an iud actually does not keep you from ovulating, but if you're not getting a menstrual cycle, you don't have a sense of whether you're ovulating or not. So yeah, I mean, in theory, you can get pregnant right away from getting off the pill. And I don't tell patients necessarily to uh, avoid trying to get pregnant, but I would say that if you, know, if you have a set day when you want to start trying to get pregnant, get off the pill a few months beforehand. And if you are, you know, if it's acceptable for you, if you were to get pregnant beforehand, then that's fine. But give yourself some time because what if you're somebody who just doesn't ovulate, but you have no idea? Yeah. Right. So yeah. you want you want to give yourself time to have a sense of what's going on with your body. You know what I'm thinking? This is totally not about what we're talking about. What what would be an ideal world, in my opinion, is because I have been studying and reading articles just like you have part of our training, but throughout all these years. And I probably have so many things, but now we're so busy with practice that sometimes I'll tell my patients, you know, there was research that found this, this, this. And then talking to you right now, it would be amazing if there was that union where we looked at what is optimal. Yes, we might not tell patients to stop, you know, not conceiving right after the pill, but is that optimal? How long has it been shown that when you do get off the pill, it takes to have to normalize your period again? And how, how can we change this? Because patients, I find, are their own advocates at times, and they, they get frustrated. They're in the middle sometimes going, but this doctor said this, and then my friend said this, and then this other doctor said this. And it, it's, it would be great to have that one research, which is why I love what Jennifer's doing for us all, is bringing us together so that we can start having these discussions and look at the data, look at the clinical data that we both have, and then kind of give patients the best of both worlds, and then also individualize it for their case. Oh, totally. And I think the key is when we're talking about what the optimal range are, I think helping people understand, well, when we get a range, like, you know, I order a test and it gives us the range, what does that range really mean? Well, mm -hmm. that range is a wide range, right? When actually 95% of people who have a normal value are going to be within a certain range. And that, yeah. you know, if, if a normal value is 0.5 to 5, the majority of people who have normal values are actually going to be probably between one and two and a half, right? Yeah, exactly. And so four is normal, 
but actually, yeah. you know, they're going to have symptoms. No one's no one at TSH of four usually feels optimal. <laughs> I'm assuming yeah. that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, totally. So the whole point is understanding things. And I always counsel patients about, you know, there's margins of there's, you know, there's margins of errors with labs, right? Basically, yeah. you're running a test, you're running an assay and dependent upon the, the type of hormone it is and the type of assay that they're running and, and the lab and how often that lab runs that hormone, you can have yeah. variations, right? So I can run a lab, I can run a value in my lab, you can run a value in your lab, and we can get variations that may not seem that big when talking yeah. about whether to treat somebody and how we're treating them and chasing a value. You have to just think about all of that. We can't just focus on just the number. We have to focus on kind of overall everything before being able to adjust things and things of that sort. But on the other hand, though, Oftentimes, by the time somebody has come to see me, you know, every month matters sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily for every patient. We, you know, if someone's Absolutely. on the younger side, sometimes we'll say, okay, wait, you know, how do you, and I ask them, how do you feel about taking two to three months to optimize things by, by doing some of these things that we're going to talk about? And for some patients, they would much rather do that and take a step back and move forward mm -hmm. than just kind of power through. Yeah. Right? And studies okay. have shown that in, even as women get older, taking two to three months off doesn't make a significant difference in their outcome, but sometimes it makes a significant difference in their mental and emotional outcome. Yeah. There's a couple things that we haven't talked about that, that based on the questions we got beforehand might come up was if you could just address those that are, are already at, at advanced age and how they might factor that into their current state of fertility. And then those that are looking at preservation. Mary, like, let's say I have a patient who wants to think about freezing her eggs in the next six months and they come to see you, maybe you could take it from there. Like, what do you, how are you going to counsel them? Yeah, so I would say we are going to optimize the way I would, even if you weren't to do that. Because for me, your whole health affects your antioxidant levels, your inflammation, your sugar, your hormones, right? So I, I try not to label and put that pressure on the patient. I try and go, we're going to get you in the best shape that we can in these months. And we're going to do it through diet. I always, being an ND, that's where we start. We're going to optimize the gut and the immune system and the microbiome. We're going to help make sure your stress levels and cortisol and blood sugar and all of that is normal. But a lot of the assessment is on their symptoms. So I'm taking a good case just like you would, looking at their history from the day they were born until now and seeing what went off for it first? What did we band-aid? What did we mask? You know, and often it's like, oh, when I was 13, 14, I started with this and then I went on the pill. So that usually gives me a clue as to maybe something was off then that we haven't addressed and I need to address that now. But really with, with egg retrieval, or I wanna make sure that the antioxidant levels are as high as they can be. If we're doing embryo, then obviously for both partners, we wanna make sure their diet is as clean as they can be. They are not consuming GMO, non-organic, you know, pesticide, full of mercury, artificial sweeteners, alcohol, um, even caffeine. I find so many people are so sensitive to it. They just don't even know it. They've just gotten so many receptors to it that now they're fun functioning super well with all the caffeine. Um, but it can rise insulin and can be an issue sometimes for fertility. So I'm really trying to make sure they're on the best diet that can be for them. And that's different for everyone. Someone with PCOS, someone with um, you know, who's very anemic, I might tell them to eat meat, whereas someone else, I'll say, no, we need to go on a therapeutic diet for you. So it really is individualized. I would love to give the general um, answer, but usually I'm doing diet, lifestyle, and supplementation and making sure everything else like sleep and exercise and body fat and mental, emotionally, they're at peace. They're not worrying. They're not overthinking. Um, and, and they are relaxed. They are enjoying this process of creation, of creating life, that this is something fun. Instead, often I see people are so stressed and that can be a problem in itself. So there's a lot of mental, emotional counseling and lifestyle counseling that I will do as well. I think the key is that for some people, creating a baby isn't fun and there's nothing we're going to do to make it fun. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's good, so many, and for some people, especially when they see you, maybe, maybe at the beginning when they're like 28 and they're coming to see me, they're like, how should yeah. I eat? You know, it's very yeah, different. Yeah. You're right. But totally, at an advanced yeah. age, you're absolutely right. If someone's yeah. 40 or 38 and they've had it, they're having issues. No, we have to be realistic and do the best we can. Exactly. Yeah. So like when someone comes to me and says, okay, how do I prepare? Right. Mm -hmm. So one thing I just say is, you know, how do you feel? Do you feel like you are ready to do this? Right. If somebody feels like, well, you know, I haven't been eating that well, or I've been drinking a lot, then I say, okay, let's take a break. Mm -hmm. Try to, you know, try to optimize things because 
it depends on their age and how old they are and what the ultimate goal is, right? But if someone's 35, yeah, they're of an age where we want to move forward, but take it two yeah. or three months off, right? Because maybe at the end, the outcome may have been the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the whole point is like, do you feel like you put your best foot forward? And I do that for everybody, whether they're trying to have an embryo transfer or they're doing an IUI, you know, mm -hmm. like oftentimes we're not in a position where we can completely stop and regroup. But yeah. for some things where we can, I make sure that we are doing our best to put our best foot forward. So when someone's coming about freezing their eggs, I would say, hey, you know, you know, I, I don't say that they have to stop drinking, but I would say, you know, you don't want it to be a month where maybe back pre-COVID people had a bunch of events and they were planning to drink a lot immediately preceding it. And I would say, let's try to optimize, get you as healthy as possible um, so that we optimize our outcomes. Cause not just, you know, about the eggs, you're taking medications, you're doing a procedure, you're getting anesthesia. I need to yeah. make sure that you, you know, you're, you're healthy for something that, you know, is not entirely elective, but we're considering to be elective. Yeah. So this is where I think it'd be, if we work so well together, because I, I'm doing the stuff that I'm making sure their liver is in the best shape they can be to process all the hormones, to process the anesthesia, because yeah. often patients will come after and they'll tell me I've done this twice. I can't take it anymore. My body is just, I, I'm not doing it. It was horrific. Yeah. And then there'll be the other person who's like, no, oh, it was, it was bad. It wasn't fun, but like, I, I can do it again. You know? And so but, there's a difference. I would say some of that is not just physical. It's mm. how were they, were they prepared for it? Were they, mm. you know, were their expectations managed? Did they have the right mm. care? Did they have the right kind of people guiding them through, especially mm. for like something that one would consider elective, you know, mm. it's very different for patients who've been struggling for a long time and then now they're ready to do it. I mean, it's very different, you know, like, yeah. for, you know, and I have to be very thoughtful about what I say to patients who've been trying to do things for a long time because anything I suggest or I talk to them about, they are willing to do it. And mm. I have to understand, you know, and, and counsel them about the pros and cons of everything, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But when we're doing something elective, um, people don't realize the emotional aspect of it and how their, you know, their hopes are hanging on to every ultrasound, every blood test. So yeah. counseling patients and making sure that they feel like, you know, they understand what's going on and what to expect, I think has a huge change on their experience at the end. And I think, you know, when you ask person A versus person B what their outcome was and how they endure the process, I think that's a huge yeah. part of it. Which brings us to our next question. What role does mental health play in getting pregnant and fertility treatment? Touched on it a little bit. I mean, you know, I think it plays a, a big role. I think it depends how you approach it. Right. So and I counsel patients who are just trying to get pregnant. I say, hey, even if you're not tracking anything, right, if you think you're having regular cycles, just having unprotected sex twice a week should cover the window of time. So one way to approach it is to say, hey, you know, make it low stress. Don't worry about tracking it. Try for a month or two or maybe even three months, depending on your age, without that. OK, if that doesn't work, then maybe consider doing ovulation predictor kits and apps and, and basal body and all these things. Because the more, you know, the more stress you put on yourself, the more stress you're going to feel and yeah. the harder the process is going to be. So if you already are, are feeling that way at the very beginning, it's going to make it harder if it doesn't work out how you expect it to work out. Now, from my understanding is most of the studies we have a lot on fertility is like with IVF, like where we can actually take the egg out, like in, in normal pregnancy, we're not going to go and mess around and get aggressive and do a lot of research, right? So yeah. I want people to know that some of the stuff, it's limited because of how we can research this, right? It's just not ethical. But from what I know in, in, in my 13 years of treating chronic disease is stress affects everything I mean, we know that and so is there enough research showing that high cortisol or, or flatline cortisol curve and, and having issues with your adrenals and stress responses affects fertility I would love to hear your take I do hear a lot of my my gynecological friends saying no cortisol has nothing to do with fertility and I don't think I agree I mean I've seen my patients who are very high cortisol low progesterone because Progesterone converts um, to cortisol as well, and we know that. But in some cases, I can say, no, it, it does, didn't seem to. There are lots of people with high cortisol, high stress, like you said, who get pregnant, they have healthy babies, they're fine. We do know how cortisol affects babies during pregnancy, but do we have enough data before when someone's trying to conceive naturally without IVF? Has, has there been enough data that you know of looking at cortisol levels and how easily people get pregnant and their birth outcomes, not that I'm aware of. I don't think that direct measurement has been studied. 
Well, what we know is this, right? We know that diseases like Cushing syndrome and Cushing disease where patients have mm-hmm. excess amount of cortisol, that can affect their ovulatory pattern, right? Because yeah. that can affect the brain, uh, the signals that are sent to, you yeah. know, to, to, in order to get the egg to, to release and to have regular ovulatory cycles. So patients who have extremely high levels of cortisol, like in certain diseases, yeah, it, it totally affects fertility and their ov- ovulatory status. I mean, it's hard to tease out, right? If somebody who's yeah. stressed and has a higher level of cortisol affecting, I think it just goes to twofold, right? I mean, again, yeah. it's kind of like the mantra, telling someone that, you know, they're infertile because they're stressed is only going to cause them to be more stressed. And I, yeah. I counsel patients about that. And mm-hmm. so what I say is, again, you want to optimize things, you know, mind, body, and soul. So you want to optimize things. We're optimizing the body. You want to optimize, you know, your stress level, understanding you're not going to take away all of your stress, mm-hmm. but yeah. what can you do to help with that? Right. So mindfulness, that. meditation, those are things that you can exercise is one that helps with stress. But during a lot of fertility treatments, it's because of the size of the ovaries, we limit exercise. Mm. And that's hard because that's how, you know, a lot of people have underlying anxiety and stress. Mm. I mean, who doesn't? And exercise, although it's a great way to cope with that, we limit that and that adds to that. So trying to find that. other ways to cope with the, the mental and emotional aspects of it is going to help. The other thing that people don't get is that there's a high dropout rate with infertility treatment, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the stress and the emotion of it. So when I talk to patients, I say, look, you know, we have a goal. Our goal is to help you get to a baby. And it's not just about getting there. It's how you get there, Mm -hmm. right? Because there's been data that talks about the long lasting trauma associated with infertility and recurrent pregnancy Mm -hmm. loss. So Mm -hmm. if the process to getting you there is so traumatic that it crushes your spirit or it, you know, or it precludes you from coming back to have a second baby, well, then I've effectively yeah, I helped you have a baby, but I've changed you and yeah. I've altered the trajectory of your life, right? So oh, wow. the process is, I think, key. And so doing what you can, I mean, this is a unique situation with COVID. A lot of the, the support that you would have yeah. might be limited, but you know, we're yeah. lucky in Orange County. We do have some support groups that we recommend to our patients, like yeah. um, Resolve is a group. There's one locally called um, Infertility Unfiltered that so many of our patients have gone to and really found um that could be a great resource that now because of COVID it's virtual, but the key is just having some sort of outlet or support, whether it be your doctor or your, the nurses in the clinic or a friend or family or or support group is key because it does have an important um, effect on your outcome. Yeah. So so Jennifer, just to recap what you asked us, it absolutely does. But I think what you're hearing from both of us is that what you think about stress and how you perceive stress and what you do about it is a lot more important than whether or not stress affects fertility. We all have stress. Every yeah. single human being on the planet is going to have stress. Now, whether it's from IVF or having no cervical mucus or you know, worrying about what should, supplements should I be taking, it, it depends on the person. I have very type A women who are just so, so stressed about, you know, even the kind of CoQ10 dosage they should be on, you know, and then I have someone else who's super relaxed and is like, I'm loving my chocolate and my sweets every day. And sometimes ignorance is bliss. Honestly, even though I'm in this field, I tell my patients, don't worry about it. And I try to help them figure out what is the underlying anxiety really about sometimes it's not even about the thing that we are discussing or they're coming in to see me it's from childhood trauma it's from unresolved issues from the past and this is just bringing it up their worthiness of am i good enough am i going to be able to be a mother can i do this and it becomes this thing that they become attached to and sometimes doing these mind body groups and support groups and being able to just freely get to that is what releases and we see these honeymoon babies we see these babies that when you stop trying happen why is that it's because yeah. everything flows better so i think it's really important i always tell my patients to become friends with your stress when you're having a stress response when your heart is beating fast when you're getting upset when you're getting hot when you're sweating anytime you have a response see the intelligence in your body trying to tell you you something is off don't fight it don't take a pill for it don't try and suppress it see if you can actually witness it and be curious about it and and they've seen uh, there's a really good ted talk um, calling called becoming friends with your stress where they looked at men and women who believe stress was bad for them versus not and they measured the endothelial lining in their vessels and their heart 
reaction to it's it's unbelievable this research because we all know that perception is important but to actually see this in cardiology affecting what your belief is on something mentally is extraordinary so i always tell my patients to watch that uh, ted talk and understand that becoming friends is the way we want to look at it and I, I i'm at fault for telling my patients stress is bad that is part of the problem stress is not bad what you think about stress is more is what's bad so let's let's go on from today really embracing that if we are stressed about something don't judge that don't judge it at all because that that's where the harm can come in Good, but I would just add, though, you know, mm -hmm. if anyone is undergoing mental health issues and they feel like they would benefit right. from from medication, I, I don't think that that should absolutely. preclude pre preclude no. them from doing that. Yes, yes, yes. no, that's what I, that's not what I was talking about. But yeah, absolutely, yeah. thank you for adding that. Yeah. We have a, at least one question about lifestyle, and it's a huge area. Both of you have very particular views about. So, mm -hmm. if you want to dive into that. Um, okay, one thing is exercise. I think exercise is key. It's important to maintaining a healthy lifestyle, but you got to keep track of how much are you exercising, right? Because sometimes patients can overexercise, and one sign of having too much exercise is not having a menstrual cycle. So oftentimes, if you exercise too much, it can actually suppress the signals from your brain that go to your ovary to induce an ovulatory pattern. So I think that's key. And I also think exercising to the point where you know, if you needed to cut back on it, that that wouldn't affect you, your overall health or your mental health. Um, exercise is a wonderful stress reliever, but like I mentioned, sometimes during the process of being pregnant or getting pregnant, you might have to limit your exercise. So having a diverse form of exercise, not just cardio, not just weightlifting, but a combination of things is probably the best. And for patients who aren't um, exercising, I would recommend you start exercising because you want to be in your best self for when you do get pregnant because your body is going to change and the healthier you are and in the better shape you are, the better you're going to be able to endure the changes of pregnancy and what come afterwards. I love that. So you're talking more specifically when they're going through a treatment with you. What about like if they're just coming to you and they're like, you know, we want to start trying what, what sort of advice do you give? Do you let them do whatever, whenever, part of the day, HIIT training, yoga, any, any favorites or any recommendations? Yeah, so running is a common one. And I would say, um, you know, I counsel patients that when they're runners, I think it's great, but incorporate something else in there because yeah. running is one that tends to affect their auditory pattern probably the most. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can run when you're pregnant, but it just kind of depends on the situation. So I would say if your sole, um, if your sole way of exercising is running, try mixing something else in there. Um, I love that. I love um, that like yoga is great. As they're approaching getting pregnant, I say cut back on the hot yoga uh, because, you know, you could be pregnant, not realize it, and you could affect your blood vessels and dilating. You're more likely to, to pass out. And also when patients are pregnant, we don't like their body temperature rising too high. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think the key is diversify. So yeah. that way, like when, you know, when patients are trying to get pregnant, um, I usually say when you're trying to get pregnant, don't start anything new. That's not the yes. time to take up CrossFit if you're not into CrossFit. If you're a spinner, keep spinning. Maybe try, you know, yoga or Pilates, but nothing too intense. Um, but the key is diversifying and making sure that it's not affecting your overall health, that you're not losing out, like you're not you know, having significant changes to your weight and that you're not missing out on your, on your menstrual cycle because of it. I'm smiling because I feel like I'm watching myself talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that is exactly what I say to the T. Um, so I love that. I actually want them to do some flexibility, balance, yeah. walking, being in nature. I care more about them instead of like, I got to lose weight. I got to lose fat to to be outside you know so that their heart rate variability has been shown to be best when you're actually in nature so get out go to the beach walk on the beach don't worry too much but if i have a patient who is pcos and has high androgens i will probably prescribe more of a hit training i want to burn that testosterone up so that exercise for me i'm a fitness instructor as well so I have training and figuring out for my patients also based on their cortisol levels. So if someone has high cortisol in the morning, I'm not going to have them exercise necessarily more than 20, 30 minutes because that will raise their cortisol even further. And if someone is really tired at night, you know, sometimes I'll have patients exercise at different times of the day based on their symptoms and labs and what the goal of the exercise is. Sometimes it's therapeutic. We are really trying to lower insulin 
and it's been shown intermittently if you even just do hit training 15 minutes at night it will lower blood sugar in the morning and so again it all depends on where you're at so don't just go out there and you know make sure that's why there's always that disclaimer to check with your doctor um, but I love that what you said, electrolyte balance and losing so much sweat and, you know, your potassium and magnesium is really important. So if it's really hot out and you could be pregnant and you tend to have low blood pressure, I have seen people faint in hot yoga, you know, that shouldn't be doing that. So I, but I do think one of my favorites is moving the hips, bringing that blood flow to the arteries around the uterus and the ovaries and bringing that diaphragm, moving it so that that parasympathetic vagal tone gets tonified and relaxes you. And that is one of my favorites is yoga for that. So I do think you, it's great to start if you're not, but again, you don't want to start anything brand new as soon as you find out you're pregnant, which does happen. I have seen people all of a sudden go, I'm going to start prenatal yoga. And then they go yeah. and they hurt themselves, you know, or they, they go to yeah. Bikram yoga. And it's like, that's not the time you don't want, you want to continue what your body has known. So if you've been running, maybe you can run, but I don't like running. It's not my favorite exercise for fertility. I do see a lot of women with amenorrhea, hypothalamic amenorrhea and, and from over-exercising. And so as long as it's, it's the right amount and the right pace and not too much and that your body is telling me it loves it and it's doing well, then I'm all good. But we want to listen to the body and make sure it's the right kind. Totally. And for patients trying to lose weight, I just say, you know, start off, if you can, 30 minutes a day, five times a week, walking, right? Love and that. I... And especially when you're pregnant, sometimes, you know, in the first trimester, we will talk to patients about limiting how high their heart rate gets. Mm -hmm. So the more cardiovascular exercise you do, even if it's walking or, or fast walking, it's going to condition your heart, right? So like, you know, for anybody who is less physically active, you'll realize that if you exert yourself at all a little bit, your heart rate goes up, right? Yeah. So that's why exercising before you get pregnant is key. Because if you're already conditioned, your heart is conditioned, it's less likely to have fluctuations and, and variations in your heart rate so quick. And that's oftentimes how women have more pregnancy symptoms, how they feel dizzy or they feel lightheaded when they get up because they're just not as conditioned. So optimizing, you know, it's not just about getting pregnant and, you know, there's some comfort in having the nausea and the symptoms of pregnancy, but you got to function during the beginning part you of do. pregnancy. And you just reminded me of, you know, sometimes when I have a pregnant patient who has issues that affect fluid and their heart, and it is an early marker of how strong is that muscle to be able to handle all that extra fluid and blood that now you have. So it's very important, even for that reason, to condition before so that things don't occur and you don't have complications during pregnancy and that, that the muscle and the vessels of your legs, right? We do get a lot of varicosities that can happen with pregnancy, muscle cramps, magnesium deficiency, everything is nice and tonified and as strong as it can be and optimal before. We have a number of very specific questions from our community here. What foods would you recommend to start preparing? I'm all about diversifying your meals and your prebiotics and your probiotics to help the microbiome. So I don't care so much. I mean, I do care what you eat and put in your mouth, but I prefer if you do not eat the same breakfast every single day and have the same turkey sandwich every single day and have wild salmon because of the omega-3s every single day. You really want to diversify and eat a rainbow of fruits and vegetables that's non-organic, non-GMO as much as you can, right? And if you can't, you don't want to get organic, at least look up the dirty dozen, the ones that have the most pesticides and chemicals. You don't want to be putting that, like eat like a queen. I always say this is a time where you treat yourself like a queen. And, you know, berries are great. So you want low glycemic. You don't want a lot of things that's going to spike that sugar. Um, keep your fruit away from your foods. It's better digested. Don't have like that typical breakfast, the American breakfast with, you know, fruit and egg and every, everything. Keep it simple so you can digest. You should feel energized when you eat. If you are craving sweets after you just had lunch and you're getting really sleepy and tired, that might be a sign that you, you're having a hard time digesting that meal. We shouldn't be craving glucose after we just had a massive lunch, right? So that's really important. When you eat is just as important as what you eat. So I prefer my patients who are not hypoglycemic to go into that fasting range and even do an intermittent fast 12 hours between dinner and breakfast. So again, I wanna emphasize 
don't worry too much, you already know things that are not good for you, like eating too much cake and cookies and, you know, Sprite and Coke and all these things everybody knows. You don't need your doctor to tell you those things, but there are things that are important for fertility, such as iron, iron rich foods. So, again, based on your labs, you want to look at that, but I look at the Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine perspective of what's good for fertility. And I usually tell my patients not to have too much raw foods, obviously, raw fish. But even raw salads, raw smoothies every single day, people think it's healthy. But believe it or not, a lot of people actually don't do well when they have a lot of raw. They'll say, I'm gassy, I'm bloated, and, you know, I had all that broccoli, I had all that cruciferous vegetables, which are really good for estrogen detoxification, but they're all gassy and bloated. So again, cook your meals, soups, stews, get all the nutrients in your soups and broths so that it, all the vitamins and minerals that just got out of that meal into the heat, into the water, you're actually consuming it. You're not throwing it away. And, you know, things like barbecuing and chard, that black carcinogenic things, you want to start just refining that and removing those, especially when you're trying alcohol. Refined sugars, I would say, are just as bad as bad oils. Oils are just as important. So everyone thinks sugar is bad, but just be careful. If you're going out, you know, and you're eating out a lot, they don't always use the best oils. They use a lot of cheap things that are hydrogenated and high fructose corn syrup and hydrogenated soybean oil and all these syrups, right? That's what makes things taste good. So I usually just say try to cook more if you can at home. Um, remove if you're a pescatarian, watch out with how much tuna and you know the high mercury fish you're having. If you're having a lot of soy and tofu and soy milk, maybe just cut that out or make sure it's non-GMO organic processed deli meats and things like that, dried sausages, hot dogs, bacon, that kind of thing. It typically is not my favorite for fertility. One of my favorite foods is actually a grass-fed or organic liver for the, the nutrients it has. Now that's also traditional. That's how we grew up. It might gross you out and you're not going to have liver. That's okay. But it is very dense in the vitamin A that we need. And many of us just don't get enough of that. But I do like, I'm not a huge fan of a vegan diet for fertility. I find most of my patients who are vegan or, or vegetarian are very low in B12, iron, zinc, and they're just not getting enough of the nutrients they need. So I like eggs for the choline content. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. But usually the, I, I'm a big fan of fat, like fat is good for you, especially if you're having yogurt, have whole fat, don't do this fat free everything. Um, cheese in Chinese medicine, typically, if you have a lot of what we say dampness or PCOS, or you you're tend to be on the heavier side, cheese and dairy sometimes might not sit well with you. And most people know, you know, if they have ice cream, or they have a glass of milk, they might get some stomach upset or some loose stools and listen to those because that can cause inflammation in the gut and it can have, you know, effects on the rest of your body. So sometimes I say just eat really clean and eliminate those for three weeks and then reintroduce them and see, listen to your body, see how it feels. But at least for the most part, get rid of the dirty that I just mentioned, alcohol, refined sugar, um, and all the non-GMOs, artificial sweeteners, the high mercury fish, and then make sure you're getting foods that are, you know, green leafy vegetables, dandelion, things that are rich in the B vitamins and the fiber that can also help the sugar cravings if you're having them. And then as much as you can, organic, fresh, you know, rainbow of fruits and vegetables, artichokes, Beets, beets are amazing. I love beets for the liver and nitric oxide content. Goji berries, so high antioxidant rich foods. Goji berries, wild blueberries, jicama, cranberries, dates, eggplants, all that polyphenols or anthocyanins, which are very rich in the purple or black colored fruits and vegetables like blackberries, cranberries, you know, those are very high in antioxidants. So you might want to have more of those, but also eat in season. Like right now it's summer here in California, watermelon, you know, is something we can have, but you don't want to eat things like from different part of the world that had to travel like 12 hours to get here, you know, and, and not local and not in season for that time. So that's also important. The only other thing I would like to add is I find a lot of people will want to lose weight and they start fasting. And I, 
I always say, please do not fast, or at least don't cut out all your carbs before ovulation, and especially during that luteal, that second phase of your cycle, because it is important for um, progesterone and helping the liver and the large intestine fl flush out all the estrogens more effectively. So I, I'm a big fan of squash, acorn, butternut, um, purple potatoes, sweet potatoes, quinoa, beans, lentils, brown rice, wild rice, amaranth, buckwheat, all those favorite complex carbohydrates. Carbs are not bad. You just don't want to have the simple carbs that are just going to spike your sugar. And then avocados, healthy fats. I could go on and on. I, I, I mean, I always say- We just will have to do a follow-up <laughs> on food. I think that's the answer. We've had so many good questions. Thank you to all of you who've asked questions here. One specific question, I'm currently 19 weeks pregnant and recently learned that I have two vessel umbilical cords. What can I do to optimize my pregnancy? My doctor said it's out of my control, but there's got to be things I can do to ensure my baby's proper development. No? Two vessel umbilical cord um, when there's typically three, right? So the, the big concern is making sure that the baby gets all the nutrients that it, that it needs. So I would say the main thing is just making sure that you're overall as healthy as you can be, right? Making sure your yeah. blood pressure is well controlled, making sure that you are having as well a balance of a diet as possible. You're not overly exerting yourself by trying new exercises. Um, you know, overall, I, I think that, you know, you're probably doing everything that you can, yeah. but just continue to, to monitor things to make sure that, you know, this is not the time to be adventurous or to do anything new. Um, yeah. But overall, yeah, just trying to optimize your health is going to optimize the way that placenta then feeds that baby to give the baby the nutrients that it needs. Yeah, exactly. I think circulation is very important. So I would probably do a good physical exam and just see toes, fingers, you know, making sure blood flow in general in you. Did you have issues with that before? And then as long as the baby is growing well and, you know, you've done your ultrasounds and your gynecologist is saying everything looks okay, I would try not to worry. Beets are one of my favorites for blood flow and circulation. We use this a lot in those data on helping blood pressure. So like Dr. Sajnev said, just making sure your blood pressure and your circulatory system and vessels in general for you are optimized. And, you, and there are things you can do with just diet, but if, if your doctor is saying that everything looks okay, I don't think they're just saying it's out of your control. I, I think they're probably hopefully reassuring also that everything looks fine, nothing, nothing that you need to do extra. What's your opinion on taking progesterone to induce a period after 60 days of no period? Patient with PCOS who wants to get pregnant. I recommend it. If you have uncontrolled estrogen without progesterone, if you're not ovulating, you're not making your own progesterone, your uterine lining can get too thick. Um, and so at a certain point, if you're not ovulating and you're not getting a period, we'll recommend inducing your bleed with progesterone. So I will have, um, I will routinely do that in patients who I confirm they're not pregnant first, but we do that and make sure the lining is shed and then we'll move forward with our treatments. Yeah. So if I would do exactly the same thing. I might add some herbs that I use in PCOS. If you have high testosterone, if you have insulin issues, um, things like saw palmetto and vitex, again, making sure you're not pregnant first, um, but also doing the progesterone, I found them to be effective. So yeah, we want that withdrawal bleed, but we don't want that estrogen to keep stimulating growth. Are there things to do to increase cervical mucus? Cervical mucus is produced secondary to the estrogen production. So you'll get cervical mucus when you're about to ovulate because you'll have a rise in your estrogen. So if you're not... Um, producing cervical mucus, it could be that you're not necessarily ovulating or you have, even if you are ovulating, maybe for some reason you're not producing enough estrogen. So I would, um, you know, make sure that you get evaluated. I would think one thing you could do is meet with your OBGYN or a fertility doctor and we could do ultrasounds and monitor you when you're about to ovulate or do blood tests to say, hey, are you actually ovulating? Is your estrogen level appropriate? Yeah. Um, I, exactly same with me. So it's usually a sign that I, there's something hormonal. Um, sometimes if you've had a leap or you've had a cervical issue in the past and you've had maybe surgery or from HPV or dysplasia, there might be some damage. Do you find that, Dr. Sashnev? I've had patients who since their leap or since a procedure now they don't have as much and they need to use some sort of lubrication. Yeah, it, it depends if they're, because it's coming from the cells from within the cervix. So yeah. if you have a procedure that's taking out some of those cells, um, if this is your cervix, you have some cells on the inside and the outside. So if you're taking out a piece of that, it could, it could alter it. It's possible. Yeah. It's not as common, um, 
yeah. possible. Yeah, I just thought of that. I had a patient last week. Typically, nutritionally with cervical mucus, you want to make sure you're hydrated. So if sometimes I'll just ask my patients, like, are you drinking enough water? Are you hydrated? Um, are you smoking? Um, are you getting your omega-3s, omega-6s, omega-9s? So sometimes I'll, I'll prescribe some omegas for that. Um, and then making sure they have enough L-arginine in their diet, which again, that's why I love beets. Um, evening primrose oil can be helpful. So I usually will use evening primrose oil in the progesterogenic luteal phase and then more fish oils in the primary phase that I found that help sometimes if there is a consistently, if that patient is just not getting omegas, they're not having a lot of chia or walnuts or fish and those are foods that they hate and we'll measure, I'll measure their EPA and DHA in their blood. And I see it sometimes being super low and I found that to help. Going on to the next person, my progesterone levels are low, a lot of migraines in my cycle during ovulation and before period. Should I be taking supplements? So it depends on when we're checking your progesterone level to identify whether it's low or not, but that's not uncommon for women to get migraines when we see a sudden drop in your hormone level. Um, so that's why people often will get menstrual migraines. So if we've done um, tests to confirm that your progesterone level is low, then yeah, I don't think, um, I think taking progesterone supplementation like we talked about earlier at the right time could potentially help. A lot of migraines in my cycle during ovulation and before period. So I'm always curious when patients get migraines and where their migraines are. If it's more on the side of the head, that tends to be more biliary migraines. That means there's bile. And if there's nausea and vomiting and a patient says, I feel better when I throw up and it's that yellow you know, bile that's very bitter, very different than someone else who's having it just before their period. So for me as an ND, I'm trained to understand what is causing the migraine. Is it just a shift in the hormones, which is liver gallbladder? How can I support them you know, with different foods and nutrition and herbs? So I would say definitely look at talking to maybe a dietitian, a nutritionist, or figuring out if everything is going okay hormonally. And then also with the organs that are involved in hormone production and detoxification or metabolism. But technically on my side, I don't like that. I don't want my patients. That's often, that's a sign for me that something is off. And so my goal obviously is to make sure you're not getting these migraines. And um, there are, even in the guidelines of neurology, you, you see that herbs, fever, few, B12, uh, B2, B6, these things can be low and that can also predispose you to getting migraines. And that's something that is actually on their guidelines for first line therapy. So you might want to look at nutritional status as well. Are there things you can do during the first trimester to reduce miscarriage? And what are some recommendations for recovery after a miscarriage? Great question. So, yeah, so the, the main thing for miscarriage is we want to assess, okay, when you are pregnant, what are your progesterone levels? If your progesterone levels are on the lower side, we'll supplement. Um, that could potentially be an issue. You want to make sure you're taking the appropriate prenatal vitamins. So if you've had um, you know, multiple miscarriages in the past, part of your workup might be something that we talked about earlier, checking to make sure that, you know, you are taking the right prenatal vitamin and, and some autoimmune issues that might be there. Um, you know, those are kind of the main things, uh, hormonal from the hormonal standpoint. The other aspects are you want to make sure, you know, you're as healthy as can be. We're not missing any underlying endocrine issues like, you know, is there underlying diabetes or the underlying thyroid issues? Um, is your vitamin D appropriate? Because taking the supplements and treating those underlying issues are ultimately going to increase your chances of having a successful pregnancy. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. I'll just add if there's Hashimoto's, yeah. I actually put my patients on, there is research on 25 micrograms of, of, of Levo or tyrosins or T4. So thyroid is very important. Progesterone is important, which we would be monitoring either before or right as soon as we find out you're pregnant. But what do you tell patients that ask you if most miscarriages are chromosomal, if I take progesterone, is it going to make me keep that baby that's unhealthy? That's a good question. So typically when giving progesterone, there could be, it could be a combination of both, right? We don't know when you're actually pregnant, yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. So could it, and if we, it's, it's different. If we've tested every single loss that someone's had and they're all chromosomally abnormal, well, that's mm -hmm. a little bit different, but we don't know what's actually going on when you are pregnant. So yeah. it could have been that one was chromosomally abnormal and the other had to do with hormonal. 
you're right. The yeah. odds are that it was likely that they were chromosomally abnormal. But yeah. the fact is that other than cost and sometimes a little bit of discomfort from taking the progesterone, the progesterone, it, you know, it's fairly benign. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that when talking about the risk versus balances, could it be that that's what's making the issue? It's, it's possible. You're right. It's not necessarily the highest, but yeah. sometimes it's also a little bit of mental and emotional stability, right? Knowing that we're doing something that isn't going to hurt and could potentially yeah. help is overall going to help in the process. Yeah, I agree com completely. I've seen clinically when I have prescribed progesterone and if they do miscarry and we test it and it is chromosomal, I've seen that it didn't prevent it. So I typically tell patients not to worry that if it is that it, it probably, I have not yet had a patient give birth other than myself, which had the opposite problem. So I gave birth to a child with a chromosomal issue and I did not miscarry. So I, I do think that people worry a little bit too much and sometimes they don't take the progesterone that I prescribe or you might prescribe thinking, well, if I, I wanna make sure like I'm not gonna have that, but not having enough progesterone also puts you at a very high risk for, right, progestation is for having and keeping that, that embryo there. So we want to make sure that progesterone is nicely exponentially going up. Well, because the key is that the early part of progesterone is not coming from the embryo, it's coming from our ovary, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're having a low progesterone issue, that's not the embryo, it's the ovary and it's secondary to an ovulatory dysfunction. So Absolutely. by taking progesterone early on, it's not going to keep a pregnancy that's chromosomally abnormal. Um, so that's exactly. oftentimes why we'll, we'll give it because it's, it's not like if it's an abnormal pregnancy, it's not going to prolong that. Yeah. Um, and then they asked if there's any recommendations for recovery after a miscarriage, which is a very common question that I think you and I both get. Yeah. You, want you, my, want you my take is that I tell patients, a lot of people think they have to wait three months, six months, a year to get everything balanced, to make sure their hormones are all good. And I actually say the research actually shows that that doesn't prevent from you having another one, that when you feel mentally you've grieved and you've let go and you, it's more of the mental, emotional side and obviously making sure physically there's nothing retained and you're okay, that you don't necessarily have to wait six months to, to get things the way we think in in normal or healthy range that I say, when you feel ready, you can start trying again. Yeah, same here. I have a couple questions on supplements. So obviously people asking about supplements in general, a couple specific questions on DHEA, whether that's recommended, a specific question on whether that's recommended for someone who's over 40, and then whether probiotics adaptogens are okay to take while pregnant or recommended? There are things that you want to stop taking when you are pregnant. One of the main ones I see people continue is CoQ10. Basically, many of these things, we just don't have data, right? So it might be that it benefits you before, but when we have not tested it in pregnancy, it is not safe for us to tell you to continue taking it. Even though it hasn't shown a detriment, we're still going to tell you to stop. Um, in terms of supplements, a really good prenatal for me, what I'm looking at is that it has the active folate, the 5-MTHF or the methylated folate. I, I'm not a big proponent of giving my patients synthetic anything. It, yes, has folic acid been shown to help prevent neural tube defects? Absolutely. How many of our patients now do we find that they can't process folic acid because of gene mutations? Is it going to prevent them from getting pregnant? No. Is it going to make them have a miscarriage? We don't know. In some that we're finding clinically, we just don't have enough data yet. So to be on the safe side, I just say, eat your greens, get it from nature. You know, why? let's not complicate this and get, get into a debate, but make sure you're getting your folate and your vitamin D, your iron. If you need extra iodine, iodine is very important if you have a lot of cysts and ovarian cysts, fibrocystic breasts, um, and again, most prenatals, sometimes they're missing these extra things like choline or inositol. If you have PCOS, very different. You might need um, extra things like resveratrol or berberine or Vitex. If you have endometriosis, we'll probably have another time where we talk about all of these. But the basics, I would say, CoQ10, coenzyme Q10 to help oxygenate the cells and very good for sperm and for eggs. Sometimes I will use melatonin, but I'm measuring it. And only if a patient is low in melatonin. DHEA, right, the, the, the hormone, our youth hormone produced by our adrenals, 
only if you're low and you actually need it. Not everyone, just because there's all these good things that have been shown to help, um, and, and not everyone can tolerate the dosage that was done in research. They start getting acne. And so I really pick and choose alpha lipoic acid. Again, anything that can increase your antioxidant status, like alpha lipoic acid, N acetylcysteine, NAC, vitamin C, vitamin E, um, the right kind of vitamin A and the right dose, you don't want to get too much of that, um, which many of it is in a prenatal, but sometimes I find the prenatals aren't enough. And depending on the patient's symptoms or chronic diseases or their status and what they're absorbing from their diet, I have to add on top of that. So hopefully that's that's enough on supplements there. I think the key is kind of what Dr. Demary said is that for DHEA, it's a, it's a male androgen, so you don't want to take it while you are pregnant. Um, so if you are to start taking it, make sure you're not pregnant. The other thing is that, you know, if you're making it an, an appropriate amount and you start taking it, sometimes you'll have side effects like acne um, and things of that sort. So although it is a supplement, taking too much of it might actually have negative side effects. Just a comment, like a day before, if you're doing egg retrievals, a lot of times um, it's really important that you stop certain supplements for a quality like melatonin, alpha lipoic acid, vitamin C, NAC, DHEA. And then after the transfer, you know, you want, you want to stop anything that has E or has like the, the blood thinning or CoQ10. So I don't know if you agree with that, but that's typically what I tell my patients. Yeah. Um, not to just continue taking it throughout the whole procedure and, and stop before egg retrieval. Yeah. Well, I let them take it through egg retrieval, but yeah. Yeah. We really thank you for taking the extra time to answer some specific questions. I wish we had time to get to all of them. Just shows we need you to come back so that you can share more knowledge and we can maybe deep, take a deep dive into each of these areas. I want to thank everybody who's taken the time to participate and sharing your heartfelt experiences and stories. Some of it is very personal. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate that you felt that you could share that with us. And we hope you continue to follow us um, in the community that we've uh, created at Fertility Within Reach. And of course, if you need any help, we're here for you. We want to thank our wonderful panelists for this empowering discussion. Fertility Within Reach's mission is to increase health benefits for all fertility treatment and preservation please visit us at fertilitywithinreach.org for more information on how to advocate for yourself or get one-on-one -on -one advice or support. We also welcome donations in any amount for our continued advocacy and education efforts. I want to thank everyone and have a great evening.